Good morning. Can you hear me now? Welcome to worship service this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we could all stand out of respect for the reading of God's word, we're going to be speaking from Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, immediately following um, <clears throat> the season of Advent, we got back into the Gospel of Luke. We studied uh, verses 17 through 19 last week. <clears throat> Today we'll be looking at verses 20 through 26. Luke 6, verse 20 through 26. <clears throat> And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you. And cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leave for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Let us pray. Precious Father in heaven, take these words. Take this message given by Jesus personally. Apply it to our hearts. Open up our minds and our hearts to receive, to understand, and to appropriate what you give here. That all the glory, honor, and praise go to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Bind the hand of Satan this very day, at this very time, and give us freedom freedom of the Holy Spirit to move in among us and through us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What we're endeavoring to begin today is what most people would call the Sermon on the Mount. Some call it the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, there are some things that we need to talk about as we get into this sermon, some things that are very, very important. So it puts away any kind of uh, questions up front that you may have. You will notice that this same sermon is found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. In other words, it takes up three entire chapters you will notice <clears throat> that this sermon in the book of Luke is found in chapter 6, verse 20 through 49. Just 29 verses. You may ask why, and I believe that's a good question to ask. It's like this. If you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, 6, and 7, it takes about 10 minutes. If you read Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 20 through 49, it takes about 2 minutes or 3 minutes. You will find there are things in Luke's account that are not found in Matthew's account and the other way around. And that's very important. Because this is a sermon that Jesus spoke, and it's not given in its entirety in either place. 
How can we know that? Well, I'm going to have a hard time believing that Jesus stood and preached for 10 minutes and sat down. (laughs) You can read chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew in 10 minutes. There's good reason to believe that he spoke much longer than that. Amen? The crowds came from all over the place to hear him. Neither account is complete regarding everything that Jesus said during that time. Well, we do have our main points. This is going to be important in our understanding of this sermon. We find some similarities that tell us for certain it is the same sermon that Luke speaks of, that Matthew speaks of in three chapters. The way we know that is because they both start out the same with the Beatitudes. They also end the same. They end with the analogy of the man who builds his house upon the rock as compared to the man that builds his house upon the shifting sands of this world. So they are the same sermon, in essence. Different things included in each account. So that will account for the textual variations that you see between Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. This is Christ's message regarding what his kingdom is all about. Regarding what his kingdom is all about. He teaches here what it means to be saved. He teaches here what it means to live this life in respect to the fact that Jesus Christ is king of those who believe. This is often referred to as the agenda of God's kingdom. Because Jesus lays out for us how having Jesus as king changes our life. And one thing that you're going to find as we endeavor into this sermon Jesus teaches as though his teaching is the final word, because it is. Luke chapter 4, verse 43 tells us that Jesus went all over the place preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. This is what he taught. Wherever he went, he would teach the kingdom of God. So that's what we're going to be getting into. There's something else we're going to have to deal with. When the people heard him preach, they were shocked. Amazed beyond belief. There's good reason. Because everything that Jesus taught ran contrary to popular human thinking. Contrary. Literally, we're going to see that Jesus taught things that people would never think of. And there's something else very important uh, found in this text. The people that he is preaching this to originally were Jewish people. The Jewish people had a problem to deal with, like many people have problems to deal with today. Very similar. The Jewish people were known to be the chosen of God. And because of that, many believed that they were okay in the eyes of God, when truthfully they were not. So you may ask the question, what does it mean to be the chosen of God? Well, God chose the nation of Israel, make no mistake about that. He chose the nation of Israel to be a conduit to the world. That God, through the Jewish people, would give the word of God through Jewish prophets. 
and that the Jewish people would protect and guard the Word of God. But that didn't make them saved. And so they would deal with this problem of discernment. Uh, what does it mean to be chosen of God? This is the crowd he's speaking to, mostly. We see that there are others from Tyre and Sidon that came from distance away. They may have been Jews. They may have been Gentiles. We don't know. But this is the um, group that he's dealing with. One other thing that we're going to see and I want to put you on to, when Jesus teaches, he doesn't quote anybody but God. He doesn't quote anybody but God. And when he speaks, he speaks as the final word. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19 warns of impending judgment for those who add to or take away from the Word of God. Why is it so difficult for people to hear what Jesus teaches? Well, as we said already, it's contrary to popular human thinking. It was contrary even to the thinking of those who were considered to be the religious elite. In fact, those who were most theologically astute found his teaching to be very offensive. And they accused him of speaking from the power of Satan. Something else we're going to see, Jesus doesn't add to or subtract from conventional human wisdom. He replaces it. So don't expect that he's going to add to man's wisdom. He's going to replace it. His teaching shatters the foundations of man's thinking. It destroys the motives of men. And beware, just in case you're sensitive to things like this, Jesus is not politically correct. He speaks of spiritual issues that top, topple the theological fortresses that man has established. And he does that here by contrasting those who are saved and in the kingdom of God with those who aren't. Remember, most of the people that were gathered this day as Jesus preaches, they thought that because they were the children of Abraham, they were right with God. They thought because they were the chosen of God that they were right with God. There were those who thought that because of their supposed obedience to the law that they were okay with God. And some thought they were right with God because of good works. Jesus is going to shatter every one of these presuppositions. And it's very evident that what the crowd heard was not what they were expecting. First he talks about those who are blessed. Verse 20 through 23. And he lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are you when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day. And leave for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Many who gathered this day to hear Jesus speak 
fully anticipated that when Messiah came, he would bring wealth, abundance, laughter, and the elevation of the Jewish people. Now Jesus commends all these things that the people wanted to avoid. He calls them a blessing. And they were shocked beyond belief. Many were already living in poverty, in hunger and sorrow, and rejection, and they weren't having a good time of it. So they were shocked. Basically, we know that everybody strives to turn poverty to riches, hunger to fullness, sorrow to happiness, and rejection to acceptance. And then when you read in verses 24, 25, and 26, you'll see that he also pronounces woe to those who are rich, full, joyful, and accepted. The problem is, and this is something that Jesus had to deal with throughout his earthly ministry, when people who are having a tough time of life would come to hear Jesus speak, they would tend to always see things from the physical perspective of life. Those physical things. Because face it, we have to deal with physical realities in this life. But Jesus here is not speaking of physical things. Though the audience has their attention focused on the physical, he's speaking about spiritual matters. And in the same vein, we have to understand that God destroys the wisdom of man even when it comes to spiritual matters. 1 Corinthians 1.19, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The world to which Christ came, when he came to this earth, was the one that the Apostle Paul wrote of. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 32. And they were guilty of professing themselves to be wise when they were really fools. God destroys man's wisdom. He doesn't add something to man's brilliance. He replaces it. Notice in this text the authority of Jesus. Quotes no one, as we said before, speaks with the authority of God. And he uses his authority to define who is blessed and who is cursed. And be aware that Jesus is teaching the need for dramatic change. The same kind of change that he exposes regarding the church of Laodicea. In Revelation 3, verse 17 and 18, Because you say, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Jesus said they're spiritually blind, naked, and destitute. And that they need him. As in Laodicea, when Jesus is preaching this sermon, he speaks to many who are very smug, in their lostness. 
he speaks to the people who are self-righteous. And these people will reject him. They will demand his execution to get him out of the way because he's such a disturbing and annoying person. And I want everybody to know, I think you can realize this without me saying it, but the world is the same today. Many still reject him. Now, this concept that we're going to talk about, this concept of blessing and cursing, was not something that was new to the Jewish people. If you turn back, and don't do it now, but if you turn back to uh, the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, and you were to read verses t- uh, chapter 27 and 28, you would see that the blessings for obedience are found there. The cursings for disobedience are found there. And you would understand that the Jewish people should have known these things, but they had apostatized so much that they no longer understood. So Jesus sets out here to straighten out some very important theological issues. Notice uh, when he does this, he directs his message primarily to his disciples. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, I want to clear up a matter on who these disciples were. They are not the apostles. As we spoke last week on verses 17, 18, and 19, you would see that there were apostles gathered there that day. There were disciples gathered there that day. And a great multitude of people that came from as far away as Jerusalem, Judea, Tyre, and Sidon. The apostles were the ones who were chosen to be the messengers of Christ, sent out into the world. The great multitude, as we discussed last week, were nothing more than curious onlookers who followed Christ out of curiosity. And we showed that last week. The disciples were the learners, those who were students of Jesus. Jesus being their teacher, they being the students. And we have to understand about them, they've left their homes, they've left their businesses, they came from all different levels of belief and commitment, and as we taught last week, most of them will walk away from Jesus because they don't like what he has to say. And you see that written in John chapter 8, verse 30 through 59, and also John chapter 6, verse 53 through 66. They couldn't endure what Jesus had to say. Now, there are others in the crowd, but Jesus directs his message primarily to them. Based on what we were into last week, And what we taught regarding these learners, we found out that some believe in Christ. Some believe that he just might be the Messiah. Some are in neutral. Others have heard enough and they're ready to walk away. It's a mixed multitude. And I make a point of this. Because this is an example of what we see today in contemporary Christendom. It's an apt description of what we see this day. There's that intimate uh, group of very involved people who are serving the Lord faithfully. They love Jesus and they live to serve him Jesus is their life. Then there are those curious onlookers who are curious, but not committed. They're there, but nothing more. Then there's that middle group, the learners. Some know Christ. Some are growing spiritually. Some are in the process of getting acquainted with Jesus. 
Some sit in neutral. Others are disillusioned. And they're ready to back out. I want everybody to know one of the most important things that will be taught today. Jesus preached this sermon because he wants everybody to know that there is a criterion he provides to determine one's own spiritual condition. And at the end of this chapter, it is summarized. If you have your Bibles open, turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 46 through 49. At the end of the sermon, it summarizes the purpose that Jesus is preaching this. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. What is Jesus saying? He speaks of those who hear and respond to the gospel in obedience, notice they built their life on him. He's the rock of salvation. He rules their life. So when God brings judgment, they are not touched by it. These are the ones that he says are blessed. Notice they did not build upon the earth means they didn't build upon that which is worldly. They built upon Jesus. He also speaks to those who hear the gospel and reject it. He says these are cursed. Notice the judgment is brutal. The message is simple. When God brings judgment... People stand or fall based upon whether they are in Christ or not. These that fall build upon the world, not Jesus. Two very important points I want to make about words that dominate our text. The words blessed and woe. Blessed and woe. Blessed, makarios, means to be in the most favored position. The most favored position. It means that those who are the blessed enjoy the most beneficial condition they could be in. The most beneficial condition they could be in is to be right with God. These are the ones who built their house upon rock. That other word, woe, means just the opposite. It's contrast. It means those who are most unfavored. Those who are in the most worst condition they could be in. They're not right with God. They didn't build upon the rock. And these are the only two possibilities. Either blessed or cursed. There's no middle ground. The poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the rejected, Jesus says, are blessed. The rich, the full, the happy, and the popular are cursed. By divine decree, for those who are desperate, blessing. For those who are self-sufficient, woe. 
Now, I want to make something real clear here. As I said already, Jesus is not speaking here of material things. If he were, he, by the way, he spoke about that a lot. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, he will speak about that. For instance, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, he speaks about the dangers of materialism. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he speaks about the dangers of materialism. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, speaks about the dangers of materialism and how material things can become idols that are put before God. If he were speaking of material things, we would have to consider uh, the teaching of Proverbs 30, verse 7 and 9, and the words of the righteous man there. It says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. But in the passage we're looking at today, Jesus doesn't speak of material things. He doesn't speak of economics. He speaks of spiritual matters. And this is found in the parallel passage of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 3, where it's written, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Gives us an indication that unequivocally, Jesus is talking here about who is saved and who is not. You must be saved to get into the kingdom of heaven. And he says it requires that one is poor in spirit. So it's not that God grants salvation just because people are poor. It means that he saves those who know they are spiritually destitute. Those who first understand that they're spiritually bankrupt. And I want you to know how that would have hit the original audience that day. The people gathered there thought they were okay with God. And they thought they were okay with God because they were Jewish. And they were God's chosen. Those who were spiritually bankrupt are those who would claim the truth of Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as the leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Notice, the one who recognizes their spiritual destitution, the one who knows they cannot commend themselves to God, the one that knows there's not enough good works on this earth that could be done to merit salvation. They recognize their righteousness. Anybody ever tried to deal with a person who is self-righteous? A self-righteous person has no need for God. Because they believe they're okay without him. Human pride rules the day. But the person who is spiritually destitute recognizes their righteousness is like filthy rags and that their iniquities have carried them far from God. The knowledge of spiritual poverty, I want to make this very clear. The knowledge of one's spiritual poverty cannot be artificially induced by anyone. You say, well, how does somebody ever come 
to the place of recognizing they are spiritually bankrupt? The answer is John 16, 8. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. And when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people, we have to be praying for the Spirit's work in their lives. Amen? The blessed know that self-righteousness cannot save. When we consider the word poor, I think we can conjure up a lot of different images in our mind. And we can apply those images to what it means to be poor in spirit. But I do want to clarify one thing. The Greek word here for poor, tokos, literally talks about being beggarly. Not just poor. It means absolutely known beyond any shadow of a doubt whatsoever that there's nothing in the spiritual bank. It pictures one who cringes and won't even look up at the one they're begging from because they're ashamed and they're too embarrassed. It's a picture of the publican in Matthew chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. When he's there at the temple and he recognizes his spiritual destitution, his spiritual bankruptcy, and he simply beats his chest and he doesn't even look up. He doesn't even look toward God. He's too embarrassed. He's too ashamed. And he just says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too humiliated to even look at you. It's what the word poor means. It's what it means to be poverty-stricken, spiritually, to recognize the need to be saved. Now, earlier, as we've been preaching through the Gospel of Luke a verse at a time, when we were in chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, we see Jesus was telling people in the synagogue of Nazareth what his ministry was all about. It had to do with saving those who are spiritually destitute. Those who had come to the knowledge that they needed a Savior. That day he quoted Isaiah 61 verse 1 that says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. That word means the good news, gospel, good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then in verse 21, right after he said that, he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He literally said that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, a very well-known messianic psalm. He is the one that's anointed to preach the good news to the meek, broken-hearted captives who are bound in the prison of sin. Now I want to tell you something. The synagogue crowd that heard him say that was deeply offended. And Jesus, you have to remember, 
said this in the synagogue in Nazareth where he was raised. He was what you would call a hometown boy. People knew him. That didn't stop them from trying to kill him. Right there that day, they were so offended and infuriated with what he said. They believed that they were self-righteous. They believed they were okay with God. They were deceived. A declaration of spiritual poverty is unthinkable to proud, self-righteous people who see themselves as good religious children of Abraham who are destined for heaven. Jesus overturns their popular thoughts. He rewrites them. He says it's spiritual beggars who are blessed. Notice he said theirs is the kingdom of God. That means simply they are heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, inheritors of forgiveness, inheritors of eternal life, blessed because they're born again. It's the spiritual beggars who come to God seeking forgiveness. They're recipients of the gift of God. What is that gift? Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For grace, it's by grace through faith you are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. Notice here, poverty of spirit is spoken first because it sets the stage. If someone is not spiritually destitute, if someone doesn't recognize their spiritual destitution, the rest of what is spoken here cannot happen. Notice the second characteristic of the blessed. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6 clarifies, says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, to hunger and thirst after righteousness means that somebody recognizes they're a spiritual beggar, longing for righteousness they do not have but they want it. And I want to make this easy to understand. The hunger and thirst for righteousness comes from the desire to be acceptable to God. Let me say that again. The hunger and thirst for righteousness comes from the desire to be acceptable to God. It's the desire to be pleasing to God. God is holy. God is righteous. To hunger and thirst for righteousness is literally to hunger for God. Those who get saved are those who have a deep longing for righteousness. They want to be right with God, to be forgiven, to have relationship with Him. Now many may hunger for bank accounts, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, a larger home, greater conveniences. But the hunger and thirst after righteousness, that's a different matter. This is the hunger that is painfully aware of the soul's emptiness and the gnawing hunger for the life that pleases, honors, and knows God. Like Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. That's a great song, by the way, that we sing now and then. Like Psalm 63, 1 and 2. O God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. 
my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. A picture of longing for God in a spiritual wilderness. John 6.35 Jesus proclaims that he is the one who fills spiritually hungry people. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So first, there's the recognition of spiritual bankruptcy. And with that comes the hunger for righteousness. It's like you first recognize what is wrong and what you don't have, and then you recognize what you desperately need and long for. And notice, where there is spiritual hunger, Jesus says, ye shall be filled. The word filled, in the Greek, is cortezo. It means to be totally foddered up. It's a term that applies to putting out food for animals. I want you all to know that. And it's talking about the idea of being completely satiated, filled to the brim, filled to overflowing. Jesus satisfies. Psalm 34:10. They that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Psalm 23, 1, very well known by most people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jeremiah 31, 14, my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Psalm 107, 9, for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. The third characteristic of those who are blessed. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Matthew 5, 4 clarifies this greatly. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Weeping, in this context, has the source of the tragedy of sin. It refers to people who mourn over their sin and over their spiritual bankruptcy. They're mourning because they seek repentance. Anyone that's here this morning who has ever come to the position of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior knows all about that emotional breakdown that comes from the recognition of spiritual bankruptcy the lack of our own personal righteousness and the eternal consequences. We call that the spirit of conviction that brings mourning over sin. Prompts the heart to make a decision. Sighing and crying over the absence of righteousness, the hunger One thing you have to know, the Sermon on the Mount was quoted often by the early church fathers. And it's referred to repeatedly in the book of James. Anybody who reads the book of James will pick up on this real quickly. So James draws upon this teaching in James chapter 4 verse 8 and 9 about mourning over sin and the need for righteousness. He writes, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Then He says, Be afflicted. It's talking about affliction of the soul. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. In the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. 
we see that with repentance, the heaviness of sin gives way to the rejoicing of salvation in Jesus Christ. It's He who shall lift you up. 2 Corinthians 7.10 speaks of the weeping of repentance. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world is no more than being sorry for getting caught. The sorrow that brings repentance is knowing that you're on the wrong side of God. Jesus says the people who weep like that, mourning over sin, will laugh. Not only will they be comforted, they'll laugh. The laughter of the forgiven and the unburdened soul. Joy. Joy becomes the ultimate product of the blessings of the kingdom of God. Sorrow and mourning over sin is turned to the joy of salvation. To be saved is to have spiritual bankruptcy become spiritual riches because we stepped into the kingdom of God. To be saved is to have hunger satisfied. That hunger for righteousness satisfied because we've been imputed the righteousness of Christ. To be saved is to have sorrow turned to laughter because of what God hath done. Amen. This is the blessings of those who are saved. And there's one more blessing in verse 22 and 23. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. I want you to know this goes totally contrary to human nature. Everybody wants to be loved, accepted, respected. But hear very closely the words of Christ. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and they shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. It doesn't say cringe, cry. It says rejoice. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. The first three Beatitudes show how we must see ourselves in order to be saved. Spiritual beggars who hunger for righteousness and mourn over sin. The blessing of rejection does not come from how we see ourselves. It comes from how the world sees us. Because we're different. This is evidence of true salvation. The fourth beatitude here reveals that the first three have been accomplished. When unbelievers treat you like they treated the prophets of God, you are representing Christ well. Because the prophets of God suffered because they represented God. And people didn't necessarily appreciate that. What do we know about how these prophets were treated? They were ostracized, insulted, scorned, and rejected. Many were murdered. When the unbeliever treats you like one of the prophets of God, that's a good thing. Because it gives direct indication that you're representing Christ well. This salvation has come. Think about it like this. When the unbeliever treats you like they treat Christ, 
what did they do to him? They hated him. They cast him out. They excluded him. They crucified him. And when they hate you, you're walking the pathway of Jesus. And this is the cause for rejoicing. The world never rejects its own. Amen? So as we prepare for communion today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, what is your spiritual condition? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Do you understand your own spiritual bankruptcy without him? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Do you hunger for righteousness that causes you to seek him? Do you mourn over sin and its impact on your life and the consequences of sin for eternity? Perhaps you're cold and indifferent to the words of Christ. Or maybe, maybe spiritual bankruptcy has brought you to the point of making a decision today. For those who are saved, you're blessed indeed. For those who are lost, it's another matter. If there are any in the assembly today who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is your invitation to come and receive him. We ask you, Lord, that you do your work this day. If there are any in our midst who mistakenly believe that they are acceptable in your sight when they're not, Please reveal to them their true spiritual condition. Please bring them to Christ. Help them know and to see their spiritual poverty. Oh God, please do a work of salvation this day. You're the food of righteousness that satisfies. You're the bread of life. We ask that you do only what you can do in every heart for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.